Welcome to this presentation from the Downey Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are located in the greater Los Angeles area at 9820 Lakewood Boulevard in Downey, California. We would love to have you worship with us any Saturday you are in our area. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? We're happy that you've taken the time to join us this morning. Uh, we're glad that you're with us. Take a moment, drop us a little note in the comments. Tell us you're watching. Tell us who you're watching with. Um, we'd love to see what cities everybody's from. So uh, just drop us a line. Let us know that you're watching from Bellflower or Pico or Downey or uh, just wherever the case may be. Any of you guys out there behind the orange curtain, drop us a note, let us know. And especially anybody that's watching from out of state or maybe even out of the country, we, we'd love to hear from you and see who all is watching this. Uh, we're glad that you have joined us this morning. Uh, we don't have too many announcements this week. Next week is Mother's Day, so we want to take a moment to say hi to our mom. So this week, everybody, on your little welcome video you're going to make, that's short, we're going to just say hi to mom. Maybe you want to gather around mom and she's there in the house with you and say hi to the moms. We love you, mom. Uh, maybe you want to hold up a picture of your mom. Um, but keep them short so we can get as many in as we can. We don't want to uh, run out of, of time. So keep them short, say hi to mom and make a welcome video. Get them to us by Thursday night. Um, so that we can start putting those together and have time to get them ready. Uh, also, uh, we sent out an email this week telling you the, the financial status of the church. So uh, we're thankful for everybody who's been giving online and how faithful you've been. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we just encourage you to continue to be faithful. We know that some of us are affected by the current events and so just, just be faithful as God has asked you to do. If you want to send in a check, please send it. You can send it to the church. We can get it there. Or you can send it to the Almac house. Uh, they'll get it. And just put a note in there if you like. I don't have a tithe envelope. Okay, just put a note in there. Tell us how you want it put up in, into the different funds. And we'll do that for you. Now, this morning, before we get ready to go into prayer, Edwin has our prayer. So, uh, but just before we do that, uh, if you have a prayer request, please let us know. Drop it in the comments so we can pray for you. We send those out to our prayer team, so they are, they're praying for those requests. Pastor's praying for those requests. Um, let us know. If it's private, you know, just say, hey, I request prayer, or maybe you want to drop us a, a private message, an email, or a, a direct message, and tell us uh, what, what to pray for. Um, if you give us a name that helps, you know, preach play for Lisa or whoever it may be. It just helps us be consistent in our, our prayers. But drop us a note. Let us know what prayer requests you have or what you have as a praise. You know, maybe something good's been happening. Uh, your family in this time has gotten closer. Your whatever is going on. Just let us know so we can pray with you and praise God for what he's been doing in our lives. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Now here's Edwin with our prayer. Our God and Father, we give you glory, honor, and adoration. On this holy day, we remember that you are our creator and our sustainer. We are your children, and we love you because you love us first. Father, thank you for your salvation that you give us through your Holy Son, Jesus Christ, who we love. Father, Thank you for your Holy Spirit, who lives in us and guides us to the true and your will. This morning, we pray for your church around the world and every family who worship you in their homes. Care and protect all them with your holy angels. We pray for those who are suffering from illness Give them comfort, hope, and health. Father, bless your servant, Pastor Chris, and put upon him the power of your Holy Spirit to use him for your glory. We pray 
in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so good morning, guys. So I thought we could start off today by doing a little bit of a science experiment. So if you guys have been good and been doing your homework at home and studying and learning lots of math and science and physics, you should have been well on your way now to become a rocket scientist or, or um, super smart physicist. So for all my intelligent young rocket scientists, if we put an item up here on the top of his ramp and we let go, what do we think is gonna happen? It's probably gonna fall off the table, roll off to the left, fall off the table and make a lot of noise, maybe my downstairs neighbor would, downstairs neighbor would try and come up and tell me to be quiet, right? But it's also important that we remember that things are not really always as they seem, and maybe gravity doesn't really work all the time. And when we see something like this, a lot of us, myself included, want to focus so hard on what's wrong with this. How could this be? Because this is supposed to fall off to the left. It shouldn't be going off to the right. So if, if we put this something down here and it still goes this way, that doesn't seem quite right. Something must be wrong, something's off. And oftentimes we get so involved in trying to figure out what's wrong and what's wrong with this and how, how did I do this and how did I get here and what did I do and how did, it, how did I make this happen? How did I mess up? How did I, you know, how did I get myself into this situation? And when that happens, it's very easy to get too, too, too zoomed in on, on what you're doing and what you're trying to focus on and you kind of block out everything else and you don't realize what else is happening. And when that happens, we always have to remember that Jesus hasn't really abandoned us. He hasn't left our side. He hasn't forgotten about us and made things hard. He's not trying to play tricks on us. He's just waiting for us to realize that we've gotten too too focused on something and we need to take a step back. And when we take a step back, we realize that things aren't really always as they seem and that maybe your perspective was just a little bit skewed. And so then when you take a step back and Jesus is able to take control again and let you know what happened, then you realize, oh, maybe this wasn't too bad and nothing was really wrong. It's just that I was confused and I was messed up and I was too focused on what I was doing. And when that happens, we just need to always remember to take just a step back and think about how Jesus will be able to come in and take control and let us know that it's all okay and we'll be able to see everything as it truly is again. We won't be so focused and zoomed in that we lose our perspective on these items. We'll just be able to focus on what is actually true and real when we put our full trust inside into in Jesus. All right? So let's pray real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for always showing us what's right and what's true. May you please continue to do that as we go on through um, our, this week, and may you bring us back and keep us safe so we may worship you again online next week. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, friends. Great to be with you all again. Let's begin with prayer. Father, as we now begin uh, another uh, sermon, Lord, we pray that you will be with us as we look at the life of Gideon. Lord, may we learn uh, from his examples and uh, be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, there's a story told of, uh, found in the Chicago Tribune, I believe it was May 19, 1995, almost 25 years ago, where Larry Hartstein reported on a story where a man named Randy Reed, who was 34 years old at the, at the time, a construction worker, more specifically a welder, was welding um, some metal on top of a, a nearly completed water tower just outside of Chicago. And he was uh, on this scaffolding 
over a hundred feet above the ground. And he reached over to get some more materials, and as he was reaching over, in order to do so, he had to unhook himself from his safety harness. But as he was doing so, uh, something hit the scaffolding. And when it hit the scaffolding, he lost his balance, he lost his grip, and all of a sudden, rather than being safe and secure on the scaffolding, he found himself falling over 110 feet until he landed specifically and perfectly on a mound of dirt that was roughly five to six feet high. Any further to the left or to the right, up or down, and he would have ended up on rocks or gravel. Now as he landed, the dirt caught his fall and he had a, a sore back and a sore leg, but obviously if anybody were to take a fall that high, 110 feet of, of all heights, uh, you would think that they would be drastically hurt. Well, he was tired and, 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 and he felt uh, some soreness, but everybody said, wait, wait until the firefighters and paramedics get here. Well, out of an abundance of caution, they put him on a stretcher and funny enough, as, as they were carrying him, he said, don't drop me. <laughs> he had already taken a 110 foot fall, another two to three feet, uh, he didn't want to take that. When he got to the hospital, he was in the ICU unit and all the doctors were amazed and perplexed. How could somebody fall 110 feet and simply have a sore leg and a sore back? Well, I'm sure that God was looking out for Randy that day. It takes a lot of faith to go up on a scaffolding over 110 feet high and to trust yourself to be clipped in. And yet many times too, how often are we willing to even want to, to jump up two feet or to jump off something even two or three feet? Perspective. So today, we're going to look at uh, the life of Gideon. And who is Gideon? Well, his story is found in the book of Judges. Now, last week we talked about uh, Joseph and uh, his, his brothers, and there were 12 brothers. And so, after Joseph, uh, we didn't quite fully discuss his story. We'll come back to it eventually very soon. But eventually, Joseph finds himself as a prime minister, and he, after uh, making amends with his brothers, and being able to be reunited with his father, he, re, he brings his family into Egypt. And, and I believe it's over 400 years later, there was a new pharaoh in town, one that had forgotten who Joseph and had no idea actually who he was. Perhaps um, all of Israel's sons, all of Joseph's brothers, their lineage was found in slavery in Egypt. And so what happens? Well, God sends Moses to take Israel out of Egypt. And from there, they begin this journey found uh, through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. At the end of Deuteronomy, John, I'm sorry, Moses, uh, their figurehead, their charismatic leader, dies. And the leadership is placed upon Joshua, which we could, we could hear his story. And for a time, Joshua led Israel. And then he too passes. And, and, and Israel is at this point where they now suddenly, they don't have that massive leadership that that was before and so God brings up the judges and, and when you think of the word judges it's probably a better term um, a, a better way of describing rather than judges and and instead of being in a, an official judging capacity are those uh, who led and prior to Gideon there were judges such as Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar and even a woman Deborah who was also known as a prophet and then we find in chapter six, we find Gideon. But yet, to help understand the context as well, Israel just had this bad cycle where, as Paul House describes it, uh, it was a cycle of sin, of repentance, of deliverance, and yet repeated sin. And Israel slowly but surely was following into, uh, as Paul House puts it, an ever deepening moral abyss that ultimately would threaten the existence of Israel in the land. You see, they would fall into some trap or they would ultimately, the biggest thing was they would reject God and God's leading. And of course, uh, 
things would go bad, especially a lot of the times either the Canaanites, the Philistines, and especially in this case, the Midianites would come in and they would, they would run roughshod around the Israelites. And all of Israel would finally repent and say, I'm sorry, we're sorry, please, please bring us out of this catastrophe. God would send a judge, Ehud, Othniel, Deborah. And yet time and time again, they would forget God. And especially in, in Gideon's um, time, we find that everywhere, all of Israel has focused their attention instead of worshiping God, they've turned to worshiping Baal and the Asherah pole. So Gideon, Israelite, has rejected God. And in chapter 6, we find that the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. And the Midianites were so strong, they were so oppressive that the Israelites would actually uh, prepare shelters for themselves in the mountain clefts and in the caves and the strongholds when the Midianites would come in and they would, uh, and what would the Midianites do? Well, whenever the Israelites, every year, probably in the springtime, maybe uh, actually, maybe even during this time, maybe May, um, they would plant their crops and the Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the other uh, people surrounding them invaded the country. And they would uh, camp on the land and they would destroy the crops all the way to Gaza and they would not spare even a living thing. And so they came up with their livestock, their tents, and it was almost like a swarm of locusts. Can you imagine that? A swarm of locusts. And it was impossible to count them or their camels, and so they would, they would come in and they would ravage the land. And so the Midians uh, basically impoverished the Israelites. And of course, what happens? They cry out to God. And so the angel of the Lord he comes and he sits down under the oak in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, Abarazite. This is Gideon's dad. Where Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. So he was having to hide from even the Midianites because uh, they needed to eat. And the only way to thresh the, uh, the wheat was on a wine press while all the while being hidden. And so the angel appears to Gideon. And he says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And Gideon's kind of surprised and he's taken it back. Who, me? And he says, pardon me, my Lord, but if the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened to us? And, you know, interestingly enough, I, I kind of question, it's like Gideon's questioning the validity and, and, you know, basically where has God been in all of this? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors, to ancestors told us about? When they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of the Midian? And at this time as well, Gideon doesn't know that he's talking to an angel. And so uh, God responds, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? And yet uh, Gideon's response is one of humility. He's like, pardon me, my Lord, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. See, Gideon doesn't feel called. He feels humble. He doesn't feel like he is worthy enough or strong enough. And one of the th characteristics that Gideon has is he's a humble man. But yet God responds with, no, I will be with you and I will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. So Gideon, he decides to test God. He says, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that you're really talking to me. Please don't go away yet, okay? And let me bring back my offering and set it before you. So the Lord says, I will wait until you return. So one of the first signs or one of the first tests that Gideon uh, does is he goes back home. He makes bread without yeast. He prepares a young goat and he takes the broth and he brings it before. He goes back to the oak tree where the angel is and he places the food on a rock as, as the angel instructs. And as he places the food, the angel takes a staff and hits the rock and immediately fire <laughs> consumes and burns up the food. You know, as I was thinking about uh, this, this particular incident, I'm reminded of another story 
uh, which uh, happens with Elijah. And Gideon realizes that as this happens, he is in the presence of an angel. And a God immediately tells him not to be afraid. Can you imagine you place food on a rock and this angel, he, he, he hits the rock and poof, fire comes down and scorches it. So obviously Gideon realizes that he's been talking with an angel and he, he builds an altar and he worships God there. Now, Gideon's first assignment then to lead Israel back to God. God later that night instructs Gideon to take the second bull out of his father's herd, which I believe was uh, seven years old. Take, take it and then tear down Gideon's own dad's altar to Baal and to build a new one. And then to cut the Asherah pole with all the wood, take that wood and, and use it as an, uh, uh, to burn uh, the, the, the bull as an offering to the Lord. So, Gideon, he takes 10 servants and he carries out God's wishes. But at night where no one could see him. And of course, the next day, everybody wakes up and they go and they, they, they want to go worship Baal and Ashra pole. And everybody's lo and behold surprised. Where to go? What happened to it? Instead, they realize that uh, there's, a, there's a bull that's been sacrificed to the Lord. And everybody's infuriated. They're upset. They don't know that it's Gideon, but eventually they find out, yes, it is Gideon. And so they demand Joash to bring Gideon because ultimately they want to kill him. Well, Gideon's dad responds with, if Baal was a real god, then he would have defended himself just fine. So Gideon earns a new nickname, Jerubbaal. Let Baal contend with him. And eventually I'm sure that at some point the meaning would wear up because they thought, hey, well, if, if they destroy uh, Baal's altar, then Baal would eventually get back at him. But Baal's not a real god. So let me ask you this. One of the things that I've came to the conclusion is when you first became a Christian, were you nervous to share your faith? And maybe when you did so, you tried to do it in secret where you wouldn't be seen because maybe you would want to, you would maybe mess, mess up. How often when we try to try anything new, um, it takes time, A, being com more comfortable, being more confident about it, uh, or sometimes we'll do it in secret. And sometimes God, yeah, he says, you know, when you do good for the Lord, you know, you don't necessarily have to, to blast it out to everybody. But sometimes even in our first steps, we're scared, we're nervous, just like Gideon. Now, God's second assignment is where he asks to go off and fight the Midianites because the Midianites, the Malachites, and all the rest of the other people had united to fight and take on the Israelites. So God sends Gideon, he calls on the tribes of Manasseh, Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali to fight. And he gathers everyone, over 30,000 people, I think it was actually closer to 32,000. But over 30,000 people are called to go and fight. And Gideon, he's having reservations. So what does he do? He, he asks God for a sign. And so God calls to confirm if he's doing the right thing. So Gideon places a piece of fleece on the threshing floor and, and asks God, hey, if this is what you want me to do, please, I want all of this fleece and only the fleece to have dew on it in the morning. So night goes, falls, morning comes up. He goes to the threshing floor. He picks up the fleece and he wrings out the fleece and over a whole bowl full of dew is wrung out of the fleece. But that doesn't satisfy Gideon. 
So then he says, okay, God, I, I think I know where you're going, uh, paraphrasing, but, but I, I, I just, out of, out of abundance of uh, perhaps maybe faith and caution, please, this time, I'll lay the fleece out again, but can you, can you make all of the threshing floor be wet with the dew except for the fleece? And so time goes by again. Gideon, he goes and he checks and sees that the fleece is completely dry and yet all of the threshing floor is wet with dew. Now, another lesson that we can take from this is I am glad God is patient with us even in our own lack of faith. Because personally, the first time, actually even the first, uh, first point where, where God, you know, basically scorches the food, that would have been enough for me. And, and, but then again, I'm not, you know, I'm not Gideon. And I've, I've never been chosen to go off and fight the Midianites and the Malachites. But several times, Gideon is testing God and asking for, 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 uh, to, to affirm his faith and, and where he's going. I'm glad God is patient, even when we ask for a second, a third, a fourth, and perhaps maybe even sometimes we ask for a fifth sign. So as we continue in the journey, we find that uh, in, in um, I believe it's in chapter 7, early in the morning, Jerubbaal, his new nickname, also known as Gideon, and all of his men were camped at the spring of Herod. And to the north, I believe it was roughly about four miles, the camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Moreh. And the Lord said to Gideon now, here's where it gets really, uh, really interesting where Gideon's got to have to totally trust in God. Remember, he had 30,000 plus people with him, 30,000 plus men. And God then tells him, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel would boast against me. Because here is that this has been the issue for years and especially in the last seven years. You know, Israel has, has taken uh, things into their own hands. They've trusted, uh, they've rejected God and trusted in Baal and the Asherah. And, and God realizes, look, no, it's got to be me who defends the Midianites. And so he says, my, he doesn't want Israel to think about having, oh, my own strength, we were able to defeat the Midianites. No, this is going to be a God battle. So, tell the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. And it's from there that, the, that, the, that Gideon's army goes from 30,000 to 10,000, 20,000 men leave, over two thirds of his force, 66% roughly. Well, I think if I were to see that, I'd probably be a little deflated because they're already gonna be going to get superior numbers. And now to have their force cut down by two thirds. And yet as we find as well, God still decides, you know what? You still got too many men. 10,000 men is too much. So he tells them to go down to the water. And it's there that he's gonna separate the men by those who are drinking water with their eyes, but still keeping watch. And those who just lap the water up without thinking of any security for themselves. And so it goes from 10,000 men to only 300 men. So you go from technically when they started to leave the town, 32,000 men to now only 300, that's less than 1%. Not good odds. Not good odds. But yet as they arrived in verse 13 of chapter 7, Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend, this is the enemy. I had a dream, he said. I, a, round of lo a round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. And his friend responded, there could be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. 
So even some of the enemy recognize potentially that God is going to handle this. And when Gideon hears this, he hears this dream and the interpretation, he worships God and proceeds to divide the men up into three companies of about 100 men. One of the things that Gideon realizes is that God has already won the battle for you. And especially during these times right now where there's, there's times of uncertainty, God has already gone ahead and we can claim victory in Jesus now. Not now, but we, not later, but now. God will handle the battle. Now, as well, when, when the rest of the, the big, uh, uh, when the 20,000 and the 10,000 left, uh, Gideon made sure as well, though, that they held on to all of the trumpets and all of the lamps. So perhaps maybe Gideon was already trying to surprise, plan a surprise attack. He takes all of the trumpets that he could and all of the lights, he passes out to all the men, and they go and they surround the Midianites. And at Gideon's command, they blast the trumpets as loud as they could. And then they break the coverings on the lamps. And what happens? All of the Midianites, all of the Amalekites, and the rest of their men wake up in a frenzy. And thinking that they were being overrun by superior numbers, they're so confused that rather than looking outward, they look inward and they start to fight with themselves, not even realizing that they were taking each other out. God truly was in charge and was winning the battle for the Israelites. So all of the enemy are confused. There's widespread panic and they turn on each other. You know, one of the times when we, sometimes when we, we become so fearful that we don't realize that we need to look outward or upward. And a lot of the times we turn inward and we get scared. And sometimes that's where we can do a lot of harm, even just with our own thoughts. Or maybe when we don't understand, uh, we, we turn even on our own family because we don't know how to respond. Maybe we'll maybe say something that's not nice or we're, but we just stop speaking. Um, we fight with those that are closest to us. Well, after this whole chaos happens, the Midianites and the Malachites start to leave. Gideon, with a sense of courage and of faith, goes after the small group that's left behind. And those that had tried to flee, guess where they go? to the areas where the 20,000 other men, where they had gone home, those men are then called back into battle and they take care of the rest of those survivors of the Midianites and the Amalekites. God had already won the battle beforehand. And yet, Gideon. I, one of the things that I take uh, comfort in I think Gideon was an a reluctant leader. And really, in many ways, um, I think he represents some of us who are either A, scared to move forward or just unsure. Gideon, even though he displays eventually tremendous faith, was not a perfect man. In fact, if you read his story, um, you'll read that for sure, yeah, he's, he makes some big mistakes. But yet, even despite his failings, despite the fact that he's imperfect like all of us, God still chose to use him. So, number one, be faithful. And when God gives you clear direction, purpose, move forward. But having faith doesn't mean that we just sit down like I'm sitting in a chair and just waiting for it just to happen and plop into my lap. My, my lap. It sometimes takes action. Sometimes it means knocking on doors. 
as uncomfortable as that is. You can't move forward in life if you, if you test the doors, you test the paths. But if we're faithful and we listen, God will lead us. Sometimes it's gonna take us off a detour or an exit that was unplanned because we thought we were listening and following God's leading, but really we were just listening to our own selves. Sometimes our insecurities may pop back up or we see something shiny and we think, I want that. But true wisdom is being silent and listening, not just praying to God, but listening. And as well, knowing who God is as we search the scriptures, as we pray and as we talk with one another, our faith not only grows, but our experience. And sometimes faith, uh, it, it takes time. I mean, compared to like, you know, for those who've been in the faith a long time, when you first became a Christian, or maybe uh, like myself, you grew up in the church. And whether you're a teenager or you're 20 something years old or 30, 40, whatever it may be, you suddenly decide to truly follow God. There's a starting point where it can be scary, but as you, as you trust God, as you try something new, you get more comfortable. As you build your faith muscles, you realize that all things are possible with God. So I hope and pray that during this time, whether you're feeling uncertain or maybe you feel, you feel blessed, thank God for the fact that God is leading in your life. I pray that you will have faith to move forward. Follow God's calling. And as well, be a person of faith just as Gideon was, to take on a whole army of the Midianites and Amalekites with just 300 soldiers. God only needed 1% of the men that he originally had called. God will lead, God will guide. May God be with you. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the fact that you've overcome the battle. And yet, Lord, even though we may not know what that per se uh, may, may, may look like per se, but we can trust in you. Father, forgive us for our, our lack of faithfulness, but help us, Lord, to move forward, to lead and to guide. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage. And Lord, for those who are fearful, may we have courage, strength, and conviction. Lord, for those who are feeling doubtful, may we find faith. For Lord, those who are feeling lonely, Lord, may we find comfort. And Lord, above all, may we be faithful and true to you. Thank you for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace and peace, everyone. Have a great week.